Good evening, everyone. Uh, if you just listen to our introduction, you get an interesting uh, chorus of instructions. So uh, if you didn't quite catch what was going on, um, we ask that when you have questions, you put them into the Q&A box. Uh, you click on that and type in your question, and, and that allows me to uh, mark what I've uh, what I've answered and, and what I have yet to answer, which is a little bit better than doing the chat. So uh, if you end up putting something in the chat, we'll try to catch that too. But anyway, welcome to Garden Hour, brought to you each week by SDSU Extension. I'm Rhoda Burroughs, and I'm going to be your host. And uh, with the exception of a video, I'm going to be your your panelists tonight. So uh, we'll get started tonight uh, with uh, with a video presentation uh, that Amanda Bachman, our uh, extension pesticide educator and urban, urban entomology field specialist recorded specially for us tonight. Hey there, Garden Hour. I am on the road this week, headed home from an in-person Master Gardener training, but I wanted to record a quick insect update for everybody so that, you know, maybe John doesn't have to fill the whole hour solo. So I just wanted to let you guys know what some of the things are that I've been seeing in my garden over the past week and things that we've been getting some questions about. And top of mind are grasshoppers. Grasshopper activity is absolutely starting to ramp up and there are areas of South Dakota that are starting to get a little bit dry. Um, so your garden might be the last sort of green thing that those grasshoppers are moving into and being that they're omnivores, they eat pretty much anything that's green. Uh, they're going to be going for those green green vegetables, your tomato plants, your squash. Um, in this case, I had some that were chewing on some weedy sunflower, so that was fine with me. Sorry, everyone. We all have to have our our Monday technical difficulties on on Tuesdays some days. And isn't available this year, which is unfortunate. But we're going to be keeping an eye keeping an eye on grasshoppers as we go forward. I grow a lot of hollyhocks. I uh, just kind of let them volunteer and do their thing. But I know that they are a plant that is in a lot of yards here in the pier area. And they do come with their own uh, sort of critter that specializes in them. It's called the hollyhock weevil. And you can see on this image from my yard and being somebody who thinks that weevils are really cute, um, I'm kind of, I kind of let them do, do whatever. Um, but if you are somebody who's trying to go for the prize hollyhock, you may want to consider managing your hollyhock weevils. They have a really long snout. Uh, they're a small gray insect and they've got a beetle and they do have that really long weevil snout. Um, when you disturb the plant, they'll just play dead and fall off. Um, so one of the management techniques, if you don't have a ton of hollyhocks, you can put sort of like a sheet around the base of the plant or give the flower stalks like a shake into a bucket and the weevils will fall off. Um, you do want to be careful, though, um, about using any sort of insecticide because once those plants start blooming, I know bumblebees also love my hollyhocks, so you do want to be careful and not be doing any sort of chemical application while the plants are blooming. So if you've got hollyhocks, keep an eye out for the weevils. I think they're pretty cute. Um, so sorry to my neighbors. I am the source of the hollyhock weevils for the block. Also an update on the monarchs, probably by the time this gets aired, they'll be even bigger or maybe even in a chrysalis by then. But the picture on the right, you can kind of see actually they're on a surface that has a scale now, um, but they are getting pretty big. Uh, there are five of them, one's completely hidden and you might be able to see the little fake antennae of the other one poking its head out underneath that leaf. But if you do have monarchs or you do have monarchs, if you do have milkweed planted out in your yard, keep an eye on it, look out for the caterpillars and the easiest way to spot them is by looking for the frass or the poop on the leaves. So if you see the insect frass, if you kind of look at the leaves above, you might be able to find the caterpillar. 
And I wanted to close with this insect. It's one that I saw in my yard, but I've also gotten a couple questions about it. Uh, somebody thought that it was a biting fly, uh, but it's actually not. This is a different kind of picture wing fly. It doesn't really have a great common name, but the scientific name is Delphinia picta. Uh, that picta is for sort of those picture wings. Um, so you can see it does look a little bit similar to those picture wing flies that we talked about earlier in the season. And those patterned wings can also make it look a little bit similar to some of the deer flies that are out there that are a biting fly. But this fly is totally harmless. It um, uses decomposing vegetation as part of its life cycle. So, you know, it's one of our decomposers out there um, in the garden. So nothing to be concerned about. They're not really like a nuisance fly. Like they don't really bug people a ton. Um, you know, they're not a biting fly. So they're not gonna be, they're not the black flies that are out there right now. Um, so sorry to everyone who is in a uh, buffalo gnat or uh, black fly country, but those, their activity will hopefully be starting to ramp down in the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, this is just another sort of neat fly out there in the garden. So until I see everyone again on garden hour, happy gardening and feel free to get in touch with me here at the peer office. If you have questions, use that ask extension portal or utilize one of our garden hotlines. We've got folks in Aberdeen, Rapid City and peer right now that are waiting to take your questions. So thanks and have a good week. And thanks, Amanda. We uh, appreciate her effort in, in uh, getting that ahead of time. I should mention that all my colleagues are on the road, base, uh, traveling to and from, training master gardeners and, and other kinds of uh, obligations. So it just happened to be one night that, that uh, everybody was tied up. So. Um, so here I am, and we'll go back to sharing screen again. And as Amanda mentioned, we do have all three hotlines uh, manned now and uh, waiting to take your questions. And if they aren't sure about something, they'll, they'll send it up to uh, one of us uh, at the university uh, to, to help figure out what's going on. And we will try again here. All right. So every every week during the spring and and sometimes during the fall or summer and fall, um, we have a changing tableau of vegetables that we can plant depending upon how close to fall we are. Um, and I've been seeing a lot of questions on Facebook about, can I still plant this? Can I still plant that? And so I thought I'd call up our uh, frost map from the SDSU climate website, uh, climate.extension.sdu and SD state. And uh, this is data from 1991 through 2020. So basically the last 20 years. So it's it's already reflecting some of the effects of, of climate change. And we see here, this is, you can, you can go in and play with this to reflect different percentiles of, of possibility of, of frost. And I chose 50%. It's, it's half, half the time it will be before this, this, period and then half the time it will be after. So uh, if we look at, at the frost dates, that's for 32 degrees. You can also set for 28, which is 32 will will frost with frost will will kill the really tender things. 28 is is more likely to result in in more of a hard freeze. So, um, anyway. So, it, but if we look at the days to frost, even in the shortest growing season areas, we still have almost 100 days uh, till frost. And most vegetables are, will mature before 100 days. Things that might not would be like big pumpkins or some of the larger fall uh, uh, 
some of the larger squash, but many, many vegetables will will uh, fall under 100 days. So basically, you're pretty wide open in what you can go ahead and plant. Now, there are a few exceptions. Uh, potatoes, I would not advise planting anymore. The soil across the state mostly is above 70 degrees at four inches depth. And that's kind of a magic number in terms of once that soil gets over 70 degrees, uh, potatoes are less likely to form tubers. So you may get some, but you'll probably not get as many or they may be much smaller. So our potato planting time is, is pretty much over with. Uh, spinach and other cool season greens uh, and cauliflower and broccoli. This is a, a picture of a cauliflower uh, plant, transplant that went straight to seed. <laughs> it did not form a head. So this is what is likely to happen when you plant those cool season greens a little too late and when it's too warm. They just want to go ahead and flower and be done with life. So, uh, so we'll wait and we can plant those again later in the year uh, as we get towards front towards fall, but for now, uh, we'll turn our attention to more of the warmer season crops. You know, beans, peas, depending upon where you're in the state, you might get one last planting in. Um, a lot of our herbs we can plant, uh, you know, cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, all those warm season crops, corn uh, is fine now. I thought I'd have a little bit of fun this afternoon. I went around my house and took some pictures of some of the flowers that were blooming. I thought since Dr. Lang wasn't on tonight, I would uh, steal a little bit of her uh, her thunder and, and uh, just give you some pretty flowers to look at. Uh, the one on the left is, is a thyme ground cover that does pretty well in my yard. Uh, and, a little bit of grass will come up through it, but not too bad. And it's spreading nicely. I've got it underneath a tree. Uh, the middle picture is, uh, I believe it's shell leaf uh, penstemon, which is a native penstemon. And uh, this little thing, uh, I've tried to get it established in my back area where I have native plants and it refuses to, to uh, get established there, but it loves my my front lawn which is a bit thin right now and and it will seat itself in the lawn so my crazy neighbor it, my neighbors get to see my my craziness and that if it's blooming in the lawn i just leave it bloom because i like looking at the at the spikes and uh, sort of the similar story with this penstemon this isn't this is a domesticated uh penstemon i can't tell you the cultivar right offhand, but it kind of decided to, to seed itself. And, and I saw it growing there and decided to enjoy the flowers. And, and the bees and, and even hummingbirds can enjoy these flowers too. So some possibilities to think about if, if you're looking for something different for your lawn or, or your garden. Now I'm going to show you some a couple of problems transist into to who done it type of things um, and the first thing is i've got some monarda uh, in my front yard and uh, also called bee balm monarda in general tends has a pretty good tendency to get powdery mildew um, and then the spot it's in it's kind of shady and i don't think that's probably very useful for it so it's it's even though it's supposed to have some resistance it is going ahead and and forming some powdery mildew and you can see the little mildew spots there with the, the white spots uh, kind of fuzzy and it's just starting but you can see um, those yellow spots are also infections that will eventually um, become white as well um, it's also a little low on nitrogen. If you look down 
the lower leaves are turning kind of yellowish so I need to get more nitrogen on that and that might help give it a little bit more resistance to the mildew as well. Uh, what can I do about the mildew? I may go out and give it a baking soda spray at some point and just just see if that holds it back a little bit as long as I don't have rain forecast in the next day or two. And that's the the home formula that we've talked about quite a bit, a tablespoon of baking soda in a gallon of water. And you can add maybe a teaspoon or so of cooking oil or a couple drops of dish detergent that will help it spread over the leaf better. And when you have that, you might wanna just test it up on one or two leaves and then come back in a day and make sure it didn't burn the leaves before you spray the whole plant. Um, but that's that's one thing that can be done with that. I also have peony ring spot virus on, on my uh, peonies. I've had this for quite a while and it's actually spread underground by nematodes. So I suspect it came in on some uh, perennial that I planted and uh, has has spread to a few things. It does have a very wide host range, so it may be on some things that I don't even that don't display the fact that that uh, it's infected. Uh, it tends to make the, it tends to take some of the strength away from the peony, so it's a little smaller. But all in all doesn't seem to do a whole lot of harm to the peony. Uh, the symptoms I'm seeing, there, there are two things going on with these peonies. Those, all those little scratch marks that you, that you see there, that's from our hailstorms. We've had a couple of them with, with small pea-sized hail and they just kind of beat up on the peony a little bit. Um, but these discolorations, uh, you can see it on this leaf on the right. Uh, that's where we start to see that color breaking pattern uh, that can indicate a virus. It's it's not like a leaf spot where where the yellow stems out from a brown spot, but rather it's a variation of yellow and green in the color itself. Uh, in the leaf itself. So um, that's an indication of a virus. I would not know offhand what this virus was, but I actually had it tested a few years ago at the SDSU disease clinic. Now, the other thing I'm hearing an awful lot about on Facebook, several places and some other questions is people are seeing these uh, typical symptoms of tomatoes this time of year in South Dakota, and they're identifying it has curly top virus. And I wanna walk through that fairly in depth uh, to explain why I don't think it's probably curly top, even though, yeah, it does kind of look like it in some of the pictures that you see online, but, but let's look at it really closely. So, we we see the leaves curled up. Um, we see some distortion of growth. Um, if we look here, this flower stem looks fairly normal. Um, and the, the leaf subtending it shows some uh, distortion. So this flower is probably formed after whatever happened to this plant happened. Um, so, so those are some of the things that I'm looking at. Now, here's what beet curly top virus looks like. And first of all, it's spread by a beet leaf hopper, which is much more common in the Western US. Um, west of the Rockies, uh, although it is down in Texas too. It looks, likes hot, dry weather, particularly dry weather. Their favorite plant is not tomatoes, uh, though 
come over to, to tomatoes like a field of tomatoes when there's nothing else to eat on, when everything else is dried up, then they'll come over and feed on the tomatoes. But it's not their first preference. So, uh, so let's come back to that in a minute, whether or not uh, this is a virus that's that's going to be affecting our plants. Uh, the other thing to notice here, there's there are several things to look at. Uh, first of all, stunting is very common with the virus infected plants. Um, also, generally some yellowing, some chlorosis. Uh, there can be some purpling on the back side of the leaf and sometimes the leaf veins. And these are all uh, curly top virus infected. Um, the leaves on this become crisp. And that's something I want you to, to uh, remember. So uh, here it almost looks like the leaves are, are sort of whitening out and, and drying up. Uh, we see a flower here, but we can't see the petals, which is another sign that that you want to take a look at. So let's look then at some comparisons. This is a flower bud that's been affected by the curly top virus. Notice we don't see the yellow flower at all. Uh, and we don't see the fruit. The, the stamens have actually, or not the stamens, the sepals have actually wrapped around the fruit. And the one on the right here is infected with the virus. The one on the left is a normal fruit. So the, the, the sepals are back at the top. They're not sort of wrapping around. Um, the other thing is you can get in this widened stem with the virus. So here we have two different photos. Um, of two different problems. The one on the right, again, is the tomato curly top. Now notice the leaves do curl up and uh, they can, the petiole and the midrib generally will curl down instead of up while the leaves, the leaf surfaces themselves are trying to close over. So, uh, but what we don't see in this photo or any of the other photos is this almost uh, almost uh, uh, C shape uh, of the leaves getting so distorted and so curled up tight that it almost looks like a cashew, <laughs> the nut, cashew nut. And that often happens with herbicide damage. And the one on the left is herbicide damage. Um, the other thing that I often notice with herbicide damage, if you feel it with your fingers, it's almost rubbery. Whereas with a virus, it will be crisp. So that's another thing to kind of, kind of use to sort of distinguish between these two. Now, we have not in South Dakota ever diagnosed curly top on tomato. Uh, I checked with the diagnosis clinic. And in fact, we don't have the test for it. We would have to send it off somewhere else uh, for it to be diagnosed. That isn't to say it's never been in the state, but the likelihood is a lot lower and probably not on the scale that I'm seen people post it recently. This is another example of, of herbicide damage. Again, that C shape is just curling up tightly, uh, not even getting any normal types of leaves there. That's herbicide. The virus will not do that so totally uh, to a plant. Another one that I wanted to bring into the discussion and, and the previous, go back there a second. These are most likely 2,4-D type, phenoxy type herbicide that drifted through the air. 
We do have another type of herbicide problems that shows up occasionally, and that can be from manures or from, from compost sometimes. Uh, from city landfill compost, we've we've seen it, and these photos are actually from Washington State. Uh, but again, we see that curling up of the of the leaf margins, and uh, this is one a little bit more drastic there. And then a, I believe that was a pepper there that just got all crinkled up. And so these are all examples of herbicide damage from something that was applied to the soil. And that's another one that that can be a factor when people say, I'm, I'm sure there was never any spraying around me. One of the things we will ask almost right away is, have you put any mulch on? Have you uh, put any manure on? And I often do, whoa, I often do get questions about whether or not uh, if there's a way to test the soil. And we don't usually recommend doing a chemical test of the soil because the chemical can be very spotty in it. And so if you send it into the lab, they may miss it and, and the spot where you didn't happen to test may have it instead. Uh, and that is also quite expensive. You have to know what kind of chemical, what kind of herbicide that you think might be causing the problem to have the general class so that they know <laughs> what kind of test to do on it, on it. And then it could be anywhere from one to three hundred, four hundred dollars, depending upon what you're looking for and, and how much you have to test. So a, a good quick way that I tell people to, to check your mulch or your compost is to do a bioassay. Uh, peas and beans uh, will come up real quick and so are, are easy to to use. Um, you plant them in, in pots uh, using your compost or, or uh, whatever soil it is that you're testing and you can use a potting mix to, to make that a little bit lighter in the pot. Uh, and then you want to also get some uncontaminated soil, so it might have to be straight putty mix there, uh, or soil from another spot that that's not suspect. And and do at least three pots of each, because you know they might have just missed a spot, or or you might have had some other issue going on. And just plant it. Wait a week or two, see what they look like when they come up. Both these photos are showing evidence of herbicide exposure. So when they come up and they have that curling, you know that the soil is still going to be a problem. Okay, switching away from that then and, and talking about something that's a little bit more fun. And that's cucurbit pollination. So cucurbit squash, uh, pumpkins, gourds, cucumbers, all those wonderful vegetables that uh, have to be pollinated uh, by insects. And really to get good pollination, you need to have multiple visits of each flower and each flower is open less than four hours, usually in the morning. So you've got to get those bees in there uh, very quickly and completely. Uh, you can take a paintbrush and do the same thing yourself if you want to try that. But uh, going up to the top here, monoecious uh, means separate male and female flowers. And uh, the male flowers will appear first. So the male flowers will have thinner, thinner stems. Whoa, I'm getting too happy with my, my uh, mouse tonight will have thinner stems, whereas the female will have these little miniature types of fruit at the base. So that's how you can tell the difference. If you go out and you, one of the common questions we get this time of year is, 
my my cucumber is flowering, but it's not producing cucumbers, or my squash is flowering, but it, I'm not getting any squash. Well, that's why uh, the males will show up sometimes a week or two before the females will. So just be patient. You can harvest the male flowers if you want, and and uh, use them for <laughs> for fried squash blossoms or or other kinds of recipes. Now, if you don't get <clears throat> complete enough pollination, you can end up with a misformed fruit. And here in this <clears throat> in this particular cucumber, we see that there are no seeds, <clears throat> excuse me, there are no seeds formed in that skinny part of the fruit, whereas the seeds are just fine in the base. So these got pollinated and the seeds send out messages, send out hormones to the fruit to keep growing. And, and so we get normal end on that. Uh, but where the seeds weren't there, there was no message telling the fruit to expand in that spot. And finally, I'm going to do a public service announcement. and. And this was actually not the slide I meant to put in there, but we'll go with it anyway. Uh, a reminder that what we grow in our gardens is feeding people, uh, in some time cases, uh, immune suppressed people. And so we want to keep our, our produce as clean and sanitary as we can. Uh, when we go to the garden, it's a good idea, especially by the time you're you're doing any harvesting, to wash your hands before you go out into the garden. If you have children, make sure that they wash their hands first. Uh, they may not be as careful about washing their hands after they use the restroom. Uh, I'm, my husband is notorious for that, so I'm going to make him wash his hands. Fortunately, we got it a little bit more into washing our hands during COVID. So maybe we we form some good habits, but and also making sure when you pick something, you don't put it in a dirty old bucket, that you put it in a, a clean uh, container that you would be happy to use in your kitchen. So you want that level of cleanliness when you go out to the garden. I did see a photo today of the lettuce planting uh, right about a foot, a seedling coming up about a foot from a bird dropping. And with lettuce, we really want to be careful. Uh, and birds, especially the kinds that have the real, real obvious splotch of, of poop, uh, can carry uh, human diseases, including E. coli. So if I saw that in my garden, I would very carefully remove both the poop and probably everything within about six, six, at least six inches, depending upon uh, whether we had rain yet or not. But remove it from the garden and, and be careful uh, with anything that's going to be eaten raw. Um, and this was a slide, as I said, I, I kind of got the wrong one in there. But anyway, it shows you that that if you're drying your hands on your apron a lot or some other reusable towel, uh, here's what was on the fingers and here's what was on the apron. So when you're drying your fingers, any cloth that stays moist for long periods is going to grow bacteria. So when you wash your hands, be sure you thoroughly dry them afterwards. And then if you've got a towel that's that's staying wet all the time, change that out. Go ahead, throw it in the wash and, and get something else. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and take a look at what kinds of questions we have tonight. Is there a milkweed that has yellow tubular flower on top similar to hollyhock? Uh, 
no. <laughs> uh, milkweeds have sort of the 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 puff <laughs> of of flowers, sort of a rounded ball of flowers, not a tubular flower. Um, I can't think of offhand what what that might be. So if you can send us a picture, we can we can uh, try to figure that one out. We have a problem with tiny black beetles these on our potato. This time of year, that's probably still uh, flea beetles. And how do we get rid of them without hurting the pollinators? Flea beetles will tend to, to decrease over the season. Um, but if you're having a real problem with them, if you're, they, they will drop off towards the bottom of the plant. So you might, try spraying if you're using any insecticide put it around the bottom the other thing is that you could try something like diatomaceous earth or uh, some of those uh, types of, of of pesticides that are a little less uh, harmful to bumblebees um, if the other thing is if you're if your uh, potatoes aren't blooming yet, then the bees aren't there. And so that's kind of a moot point. And you can also check with Amanda next week and, and see if she has a different answer for you. Gnats that are on houseplants. The reason that we tend to get fungus gnats is what they're called on houseplants is that the soil is being kept too moist and fungus gnats do really well. Uh, in in wet soil. So in the first place, try keeping your house plants a little bit more on the dry side. Um, there are little larvae that will be in the potting soil. Uh, you can try repotting, uh, but that may or may not get them because they're probably in between the roots. Uh, it may decrease them and uh, then if you're keeping the potting soil drier, it should, should be helpful. Uh, they, there are some home remedies like, like peeling a potato and slicing and, and putting into the ground and the gnats will really love to use that to, to lay their eggs and larvae. So you put the potato, raw potato in, uh, in the soil and then uh, within a period of time, uh, take take that back out and, and hopefully removing the larvae with it. Uh, those are, are some some low tech ways of doing it. Um, and again, I'll, I'll defer any further comment on that to, to Amanda when she's back. Bean beetles and potato beetles where synthetic pesticides can't be used. And, Again, uh, there are some organic options. Uh, and the first is fingers. <laughs> and actually picking time to go out and, and pick the, the beetles off with your hands. Maybe you can take an army of little kids and, and, and pay them a nickel, a, a bean, or a penny a bean, or whatever the going rate is these days, uh, and, and decrease. and. You know, if it's just your own garden, you might have pretty good luck with that. In community gardens, obviously, it's a whole lot harder because as soon as you get them off yours, they they come over from your neighbor. Uh, and so, again, I'm going to defer any further discussion of that to Amanda for next week. So, do we have any other? questions from anybody or comments about what's going on in your yard. If not, uh, we're going to wrap it up early tonight and give you a chance to go out and it's been beautiful weather to get out in the yard and, and do some gardening. So uh, again, if you have further questions, join us next week at this time. And I promise you there will be more of us uh, next week. And go to the 
extension.sdstate.edu website on the yard and garden problems. You'll find the both phone numbers and emails for uh, the garden hotline. And I encourage you to make contact with those, those people as well. With that, I wish you good gardening and thank you for joining us tonight.